Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. In this changing world, where do the teachers' unions fit in? It seems to me it's very odd at a time when the income gap is larger than it's ever been between the super rich and the ordinary American people, that now unions are being dismantled and challenged. Well, anyway, here in New England, the teachers' unions have had a major impact and a positive influence on the lives of our teachers and our students. And to talk with me today about teachers' unions in this changing world is the president of NERI, National Education Association of Rhode Island, Mr. Lawrence Pirtle. Hi, Larry. Hi, Nadja. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to see you again. It's been quite it's a while. It's been a while. Yeah, Good I remember when we were working with Rhode Island's uh, Teachers yep. Association. I think we did some live shows. Did some live shows <laughs> um, back at Channel 36. Yes. And then um, I was on a few, several years ago for I this show as was, well. I think it was around 2000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, you've been very busy. I read that you've been uh, the president of NERI for what, 16 years 16 or years. So. I taught for 22 and now I've been president for 16, so. Well, you, not only that, but I read about you. You've been holding during this time all kinds of leadership positions on boards and commissions, both in labor and in education communities. I think currently you're secretary treasurer of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research, president of Ocean State Action Co Coalition, you're on the Rhode Island Board of Education. I could go on here, but I think we should get to talking. No, that's great. But the great thing is that you were a teacher, and so you understand all the issues really at yeah, a and level. You know, after 16 years, I still, I still miss it. The, the kids. Yeah, right? I miss the kids. That's what we miss. Yeah, maybe yes. not all the paperwork, but I certainly <laughs> miss the kids. I wondered, how did you, just briefly, how did you get interested in education? Well, I, I played <laughs> sports in high school, and um, I went to Fitchburg. I played basketball, and I really wanted to be a coach. and. Um, History it was always my favorite subject, and so becoming a teacher, becoming a coach kind of just followed, and uh, so I did that, and I quickly got involved uh, in the union because I saw it not only as a way to help uh, teachers, but also as a way to help kids, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're in sports and, and coaching and all that, you really do get right down to the front lines. You see what kids need. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, <laughs> I only coached for a few years before I got into the union side, but uh, just working with kids on, you know, uh, outside the classroom was, was a lot of fun, too. Well, this is great, because now you're into the policy-making part of it. And you mentioned that you were on here in around 2000, um, but your theme then was growing stronger together. And today, everything seems so divided. I'm just wondering now, how would you describe or define for our viewers what is a teacher's union? What are the main purposes? Well, <clears throat> outside of obviously negotiating contracts and, 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 and protecting teachers, um, today it's a large part of organizing around education, speaking out uh, for educational programs, speaking out in Rhode Island. Uh, we certainly uh, spoke out against uh, graduation requirement and kneecap for students, uh, you know, developing teacher evaluation, developing programs for teachers. So, uh, and then things that uh, benefit children, smaller class size, making sure you have uh, top-notch teachers in every classroom. So all of that's part of it too. Well, people like to attack the unions immediately by saying, oh, they all, those teachers all get tenure. And that means you're just protecting the bad teachers, the inefficient ones, and it's hard to get rid of them. Um, and they get right onto tenure and they have a job for life. So I'm going to ask you to, first of all, say how relevant today and necessary are teachers' unions, and then talk a little bit about is tenure still important? Sure. Oh, it is important. <coughs> but teachers' unions are extremely important, just as I think all unions are. And you mentioned the, uh, in the introduction the gap. Uh, today between the wealthy and the, and the middle class and working families. So from that perspective, it's very important. But as far as teacher unions go, uh, just the whole, as we move in education and we see, you know, Common Core coming and PART coming and corporations uh, becoming more involved in, in education for profit, uh, those, are all, those things scare, scare us um, and we need to be vigilant of them and we need to be organized because I don't believe education uh, kids should be used for profit. We're in this to educate children to prepare them for a future. Um, so education unions are needed today as, as, as much as ever, if not more. Um, and well, you, as you, far as, you mm -hmm. know, tenure, you mentioned yeah, let's tenure. Let's talk about that. You know, tenure is really just due process. So after three years, uh, a teacher would have due process. You couldn't get rid of uh, a teacher without due process. This idea that you can't get rid of a bad teacher is not true. 
uh, you see bad teachers or teachers that don't make it uh, leave the profession all the time. But uh, you know, administrators have to do their job too and document what what the teacher has done. I always joke if you you know if you want to hire me, I can show you how to do it. You know, document it the right way. But uh, in Rhode Island, we have evaluation system. Ninety-eight percent of the teachers came out effective or highly effective. So when you talk about teacher ineffective teachers, you're talking about a very very uh, small number. So I like to focus on what we're doing right rather than the few that might be uh, struggling, and we should help them. Yeah, I, you know, having been there myself for thirty years, um, I've seen how somewhat inefficient teachers um, got the right help and maintained and grew. And then I've seen teachers who did not get the right help and they were walked away very discouraged. And, and, and one, of, one of the real things <coughs> we need to do today is new teachers need mentors. They need to be prepared coming in so that they're ready for that. I mean, we always want to be compared to other countries. Or if you want to look at what Finland does, their teacher preparation program is so intense, they don't even worry about teacher evaluation because they know they're going to be successful when they're in there. So you're right. We have to make sure that teachers are mentored, that there's programs for them, new teachers when they come in. And if a teacher's struggling, we set up a program to help them out. And where those programs exist, they usually work. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Finland, and I know that Finland is uh, often touted because it has some of the highest scores, some of the happiest teachers, and, and they do have um, unions. And of, of course, we're sitting in Massachusetts here at Bridgewater State University, and uh, Massachusetts also has a strong union and has is one of the top schools, right. um, top, top school systems in the nation. So it doesn't seem that the problem is really whether you have a union or not. But right now, um, for a number of years, we've been talking about uh, national standards. When No Child Left Behind came out, I was so shocked because they said, we'll fix it. We'll fix everything. We'll test everyone. And I'm saying, we do basal tests in reading. We do criterion refs. We do individualized reading. We do standardized. But they said, we'll test everybody. It was like, to me, saying, uh, the elephant is sick. Weigh him. You know, I read that little kind of remark, and it made sense to me. But national standards have been around. And now, um, they. I, I guess what I want to ask you is, how is this whole idea of national standards how is it being implemented? How are the teachers responding it, to it? And what are you hearing from parents? Well, one of, one of the problems with the, <clears throat> the whole idea of a set standard so that whether a child's in Bridgewater, Mass, or Oklahoma City, or Portland, Oregon, that if they're in the sixth grade, you can pretty much count on the same courses, same programs being offered. So from that point of view standards make sense but what we've done is we've narrowed them down to the point in test and we become so test happy that things students are losing out on art and music and programs uh, that make school for a lot of students fun and that come uh, some students have lost recess you know Imagine in, the lower, little children. in the lower grades <laughs> because we have these standards we have to meet and we're going to test and if the students don't meet them then the teachers aren't you know it could impact their evaluation it could impact the whole outcome of the school so we've gone way too far with them uh, and you know this whole idea of uh, a set of standards so you parents would know that's okay but when you narrow it down and start cutting out programs uh, for certain courses and all this testing, mm -hmm. then it's, we've gone way too far with it. And mm -hmm. the number of parents who tell me that their children no longer are enjoying school grows almost weekly. Is that right? Yeah. You're hearing because, that. you know, the whole testing, Yeah. We do, we're spending so much time testing rather than um, than letting students learn and enjoy learning. themselves and, <laughs> you know, the whole growth pattern. So. Yeah, real learning. Um, in fact, I spoke with a teacher who's Still, in, oh, she's a teacher, but she's an ILA. She helps in in classrooms, and she said, since they came in with such strong emphasis on te testing and teaching to the test, she's two of them. One of them said to me, she was sitting with her group, and the little boy said, Mrs. So and So, do you always have to look at that book? Because they scripted things, and a lot of teachers I heard were very insulted that they would give them a script, and the whole class had to be on that page because they knew that was going to be on the test. It's almost the idea of you got to be on the same in the same book on the same page on the same problem on the same day, and that's not education. Doesn't uh, that sound like circa 1930? If teachers or are trained and 
uh, you know, have the knowledge and have the college degrees and have the experience, then they know what mm -hmm. students need. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, last year, we had a graduation requirement in Rhode Island. You had to pass the test to graduate. And if the student failed that they could take it again. And a lot of times, yes, we want them to be uh, knowledgeable in math and English and do well and be prepared. But if a student's into music and that's the career they're going into, passing a, the math part of the test may not be what's going to help mm -hmm. them. So, you, you know, every, every child is an individual. And what we try to do is make the whole group one, and it just doesn't work. One size does not fit all. Well, you know, it's what kills me, Larry, is that's not new news to us educators, is it? No, but We you, know that, but the, somehow or other, when we get policymakers further and further away from the classroom. The, and the truth is <coughs> that policymakers are further away from the classroom. We have these huge corporations who have now figured out that uh, uh, Pearson being one, that they can make a billion dollars from the testing industry. Uh, and so that's where the money is, and that's what they're doing, rather than concentrating on and listening to what teachers, mm -hmm. teachers say. And that's the biggest complaint that teachers have, the over-testing and not listening to the people in the field. Well, absolutely. I mean, the teachers are the ones on the front lines, and if they have nothing to contribute, then that doesn't make sense to me at all. So we're going to take a break. But when we come back, right now we're hearing about the Common Core. And there's lots of talk about it. And I don't think half the world knows what they're talking about because, you know, people don't have time. So here on School Talk, we'll try we'll to explain it. what it is. All right. We'll be right back. Stay with us. It's important. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. always wanted to be. Larry Pirtle, um, everywhere I look and what I read today in the newspapers, everybody's talking about Common Core. There are people with signs up, no Common Core in this state, and other places say, oh, we need them. Um, people who, well, I'm going to ask you, what do you think? What are the positives and the negatives? First of all, what is Common Core? Well, it's just, you know, it's a whole program of, and especially concentrates on, in, you know, math and English and then uh, also into science that students would, again, almost no matter where you go in the country, students would be at the same, at the same level, but it would be a way for students and schools to measure against each other. Uh, in the testing process. Um, so there's standards. So there's yeah. standards. Uh, and, it's, <laughs> the, and again, the positive side of that would be that if you were a parent, and, and one of the problems we have over 50% of students today uh, live in poverty around the country. And yeah. it's 38% in Rhode Island. I'm not sure about mass, but uh, and a lot of students who live in poverty move from school to school and from town to town. So there's some continuity there. The downside is, and why a lot of parents don't like it, and why a lot of teachers don't like it, is because it's so scripted that it takes away a lot of the creativity and it focuses, the, narrows the focus of education. And again, programs like art and music and sometimes uh, after school programs that students may may enjoy and, you know, love to do when it's part of school. You know, we talked about the, you know, kids losing recess for the test. So it, mm -hmm. there's, they went too far with it. They put too much emphasis on the testing and too much on narrowing of the curriculum rather than broadening the curriculum. And also, though, I have a suspicion that if they're setting out national standards, what might be coming next are national tests. Yeah, well, and in case of Parky, but in, in others, others, standardized tests the states have adap adopted, you almost have that. And uh, I find it ironic that some of these, some of the uh, people who are pushing these standards, Common Core and everything, uh, send their own kids to private schools and 
in the private schools, they don't have to do that. So it is, uh. there's a real, um, <coughs> teachers are very concerned about the narrowing of the curriculum and the over-reliance on testing. And that's, what mm -hmm. it, that's the major concerns mm -hmm. it comes down to. So it's just another n national set of standards and focus again on the testing. Well, talking about testing, high stakes testing has been around. I know in this Massachusetts too, uh, the MCAS, if you don't pass it, you don't graduate. And I know some places teachers are evaluated by this, the high stakes testing, who's rewarded, who's fired. I mean, closing schools based on some of these scores. How valuable is high stakes testing and has it improved learning? Uh, well, in the Massachusetts example, I think they implemented it over a 10-year period. In oh, Rhode okay. Island, we implemented high-stakes testing, and now it's been put off to 2017 um, and possibly 2020 uh, because we did it so quickly, and only over a period of a couple of years. And the, <coughs> the problem is, again, that if you're requiring a student to pass a test, what about special needs students? What about students who are uh, English language learners? So there are all kinds of things that have to be uh, incorporated into that. And again, uh, in Rhode Island, they kept saying, well, Massachusetts did it. Well, Massachusetts took a lot of time, and they also put a lot of money into the resources. Um, it would seem to me much better to let locals decide uh, their own graduation requirements of what they're going to need. What we did do in Rhode Island a few years ago before we replaced it with the high stakes test was it was part of it. Oh, so that, that. there were other, so if you didn't pass the test, there were other measures that you could do, you know, your grades, portfolios, all kinds of things. So you weren't relying on just one test. Now that and that makes, makes a lot more sense to me. Absolutely. I mean, what child, any, would you want to have your all that you do evaluated on one test on one day? And, you know, <laughs> there's, again, <clears throat> to me, if you want to solve the issue of, of and improve education, you got to address the poverty issue. You got to make sure there are preschool programs, after school programs, uh, all day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Rhode Island's going to move in 2016 to mandatory all day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of programs uh, if you really want to improve learning and education, that's where you have to focus. I hear you and I agree with you because I've taught in a number of areas and I did some after school programs for the migrant program, children from Cambodia and elsewhere, um, and they do need the extra help. Right now, along with all this testing, there's a great push for accountability. And I'm sure you're aware of Diane Ravitch's book. You know, she did a 180 turn yep. from the push for testing and all this other stuff, uh, charter schools and all. And she is now looking at real learning. And she wrote in her book, Death and Life of the Great uh, American School System. I'd like to quote and then ask you about accountability. <clears throat> she wrote, the goal of accountability should be to support and improve schools, not the heedless destruction of careers, reputations, lives, communities, and institutions. When we define what matters in education only by what we can measure, we are in serious trouble. And before I ask you to tell me your views on accountability, I found um, an article that said Rhode Island may be one of the most advanced states in terms of developing an effective system for evaluating teachers in accountability. That was from a report from the National Council on Teacher Quality. Uh, they ranked Rhode Island fifth in the country for policies regarding teacher tenure, evaluation, and other issues. So congratulations well, that to report, Rhode Island. Uh, Teachers weren't thrilled with that evaluation process because it, one of the things we've done now is you're highly effective as every third year and if you're effective every two years because it was so lengthy and required so much time, it, teachers felt that they were losing teaching time and taking time away from the kids for the whole evaluation process as did principals uh, and other administrators. But accountability, I always use the line, I'll be accountable when I get to make the decisions and I have the resources I need. And I think teachers do want to be accountable, but they also want to be able to set the standards in their classroom and develop the curriculum and have the resources they need to reach students who, who need help. Um, when you do that, then I think, sure, we'll be accountable, and I, mm -hmm. I think we should be. But we also want to be part of the process. Mm -hmm. We don't want somebody, again, like you said earlier, who's far removed from the classroom, may have never been in the classroom, sure. and setting the standards and, and testing and all that uh, when they're not the professionals. This is again why I think it's so important, why I've, why I've invited you here on to School Talk is because we do need to hear the voice of teachers, educators, not just teachers, but all those who are involved. Um, <clears throat> right now, you and I offset. We were talking about how 
uh, this seems to be a great place now for charter schools, for commercial people um, to jump in and make money on our kids. So I'll just ask you, are charter schools good for education? Uh, if they're done correctly, oh. because the purpose of charter schools originally was to take students who might be struggling, might not learn in a traditional environment, try some things new with them, and if those things work, then you would carry them back over into the regular public school. That all makes sense, but today we're seeing charters where you're seeing these private companies come in uh, around the country, uh, they're making money off of it. In Rhode Island, for example, Cumberland, Rhode Island, school district because the money files a student sends over two million dollars to charter schools wow. if those students came back they would save 1.5 1.6 million of that uh, so there are kids that are staying back in the regular district are losing out on resources and programs because even though money files a student you don't cut down on transportation costs you don't necessarily cut down on special need costs um, overhead and everything else and because 100 students leave, you don't replace 10 or 15 teachers, you may replace two or three. So we have to look at the whole funding formula, uh, number one. And number two, I think charters who are in it for profit, I have, I have some serious concerns about, uh, you know, to get into a charter in Rhode Island, parents have to be involved, you go into a lottery, and we'd love it as educators if every parent had to be involved, because those students are already at an advantage. Mm -hmm. So um, the concept is good, but I think, again, once you start talking about making money off of kids, then I think you've got to start questioning it. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be reading about the KIPP schools, or one of the ones that people tout for, you know, their private charter schools. And yet I was reading some research on it that showed that a number of studies show that in some cases they start out with a larger population, but what you just said, parents who can't keep up or can't stay with them, they drop out. For many reasons, they lose some of the students that we have to keep in a public school, no matter whether you have a disability or you don't speak English, where private, private schools do not have to, or they, they kind of, just by attrition, they fall off, and so the scores always look much better than the they be, might you be. Know, we take everyone that comes to the door, exactly. as we should. And that's what public education is about. But when you're losing students whose parents are involved who, or who may score well uh, who are really active then, and they may test better, then how do you compare the two? And if you look at it nationally, charter schools don't do any better no. than regular public schools. Sometimes they perform better. Sometimes they perform worse. Most of the time it's about the same. So we're spending a lot of money and resources on something that may not really work. And if it does, it's only for a handful of students at the expense of many. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess what I'm wondering, too, is that with um, big money coming from people, and not to, I'm not discouraging them from putting money into education, but, you know, Bill Gates and others <clears throat> who are putting monstrous amounts of money into charter schools, I feel like it might undermine the American vision of everybody should have an equal education. I think, you know, and I'm not going to question Bill Gates' no, what not motive, gonna, motive was, but... Um, if his goal is to improve education for everyone, taking a small number and putting them in charter schools and giving them all those resources while you're leaving other students back isn't, isn't going to do it. And I think in the end, you're going to see the, the achievement gap uh, grow. Uh, and again, again, it all goes back to, if you look at the achievement gap, you can talk about you know, special needs, you can talk about minority students, you talk about that, but it's really reflective on poverty. I think you're right, and I think it, uh, Diane Ravitch in her book um, is very strong about that too. She said we're focusing so much on a new test, a new set of standards, and how to get rid of this teacher or whatever, and yet nobody wants to really look at the problem you're bringing to the fore here, and that is poverty. Yeah, because poverty <clears throat> is hard to solve. Exactly. <laughs> Someone just gave me a book called Messy, and I think it's, it has to do with, um, I think, religion and faith and all that kind of stuff. And, but it's also true in education. It's not so organized, you know, a kid comes in, they're not widgets where we just right. pump. I feel like we've gone back to the factory How do, model. Uh, you know, tell a child who comes in from a broken home or who didn't have breakfast that morning or her parents are going through a divorce or are moving because they can't afford the rent and one step ahead of the world. Whatever the, co the reason is, now you ask him to take a test and be accountable. Yes, I mean, it just, yes. It, I know. I had children who came in, who came from uh, some of the Asian countries there and some of them didn't have socks on and, and poor shoes and so, and the schools have to be so careful about what they do with that too. Um, in, 
and, and, and you know, and again, I, I'm I'm a huge advocate of. I believe in public education. <clears throat> Give us every kid that comes here. Uh, let them go through public education, but let's also give the schools the resources they need to help to help every child. Mm -hmm. Because what a student <clears throat> in Barrington, Rhode Island needs in, you know, a great school system, wealthy community, is much different than what they need in Pawtucket or Central Falls or Providence. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. And that's you know, true all over the country. Springfield or Worcester, if you want to compare. Yeah, and, and in the rural areas, yep. um, in Appalachia, all over the in country. rural areas, we don't talk so, about rural, mm -hmm. the problems of rural schools either. So uh, coming to a close here with just a minute or so, how important then do you feel the collective voice of educators is right now? Oh, I think it's, it's very important, and I think educators need to speak up uh, more. I think uh, one of the things we've seen in Rhode Island around the whole testing thing is parents are asking questions now, teachers are uh, speaking up, um, and we need that voice because, and we need to work together because parents, students, teachers, educators, administrators, everybody, we're all in this together. So mm -hmm. we do Growing need to work Growing stronger together. together. Okay, there we go, back to theme? 15 years ago. And um, I, no, in about hasn't changed. In about 30 seconds or so we have left. Um, would you just say, are you having a feeling of frustration? What frustrates you the most? Or what gives you the most optimism? Uh, well, I think I'm optimistic because I'm seeing uh, more people get involved. I think I'm frustrated that people who aren't in Education. Education is the only field where non-educators control it. I mean, doctors control their profession, lawyers theirs. Uh, I wish we controlled ours. Then thank I'd be you. more than happy to be accountable. Larry Pirtle, my friend from Neary, thank you for being my Thanks, guest. Thanks, Roger. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. In closing, I'll say to our audience, in our changing world, in light of the unique American vision of education for all, and with classrooms filled now with more and more diversity in their populations, I hope that the opinions of the teachers, those who are on the front lines, I hope that they continue to have a strong voice in the conversation about education, which you know I call school talk.